Dr. Burke. Welcome back to the program. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thanks for having me on again. Very excited about your newest volume, volume three, in fact, New Testament Apocrypha. Could you tell us how you define apocryphal literature? So these are non-biblical Christian texts that feature tales of Jesus and his followers, like the 12 apostles, for example, and his family. They're similar in content and genre to texts in the New Testament. They look and feel like the material we find in the Bible, but they just were simply not selected for inclusion, one reason or another, or they were written after the contours of the canon were established. Earlier scholarship tended to focus on these texts within the first three centuries. So the idea being, these are the texts that almost made it into the canon. And they would consider anything after that time hagiography, tales of the saints. But one of the things going on in our field now is somewhat reshuffling of the deck or the categories. So there's no real difference between, say, Gospel of Thomas written in the first century and a martyrdom of Paul written in the sixth. They're still the same basic types of literature. Whether they do it written before or after the formation of the canon really doesn't matter. And we also often have this dichotomy between, you know, canonical text, orthodox, non-canonical text, heretical. But there's a lot of bleed in those categories too. A lot of apocryphal texts are perfectly orthodox and they were valued by Christians over time. Elements of them show up in iconography, for example, in doctrine as well, but they just simply weren't part of the Bible. So we don't, shouldn't always assume that something apocryphal is heretical and bad. It's just simply that it wasn't official. It wasn't authoritative like the Bible is. That's a great point. And there could be lots of different reasons why these texts were written. I had Ivan Maroshnikov on not too long ago, and he gave us a tour of the insane and beautiful world of the Coptic apocryphal acts of the apostles. And time and time again, there were lots of liturgical reasons for writing these texts, as well as what he would call a fan fiction aspect. I know you're not a fan of the fan fiction, but I didn't know if you could just talk about the different reasons why I think these texts would have been written. I, th I think the uh, earliest ones, which some people tend to focus on, that was really in a time when people were trying to still figure out who Jesus was exactly, meaning who he is in relation to God. So there's a lot of Christology involved in there, and that's where you can start to get some more of the heretical kind of features because the church moved away from those kinds of things. But the later texts, everyone is essentially agreeing on Christology, but they just want to do things like filling in the blanks of the Jesus story or the stories of the apostles. So that they add depth, they add detail. And Yvonne was mentioning about the liturgy, the Acts of the Apostles, whether the, the Coptic versions or Latin versions or Syriac versions or whatever, they were principally used as readings for the celebration of the saints. So each saint has their day. It's usually their death day, the martyrdom. And so you want something to read about them. So you, you create these texts or adjust these texts and various other things in order to have something to read and to say something about the saint. And again, very widely copied. The Coptic ones that Yvonne works with, these were translated into Arabic and then translated into Ethiopic. And they become almost canonical, in particularly in Ethiopia. And we have lots and lots and lots of manuscripts of these texts. And they were used extensively. Like virtually every church in Ethiopia has a copy of this sprawling collection of apocryphal acts of the apostles. But because we're very Western focused, because we're, you know, conceited, and we don't know that much about what's going on in these far flung areas of the world where they would use these texts far more than we do in the West. It's important to keep in mind that these texts in Christianity is not just, you know, a Greek and Rome thing, you know, it's as far reaching as Ethiopia, like Asia Minor, even into China at some points, right? Yeah. The story and missionaries. So you've been working on these New Testament apocryphal volumes for quite a bit. I thoroughly enjoy volume one and two. What can we expect to see with the third volume? Well, lots more texts. Um, that's the whole point. Each of the volumes have about 30 texts in them. We haven't gotten to the bottom of the well yet. There's still lots of other texts that could be published. The, the whole idea of the series was not to republish the same apocryphal text we normally see in collections like, say, Bart Ehrman's Lost Scriptures. So we don't do the Gospel of Thomas again. We don't do the Gospel of Jesus again. We do texts that generally have not been seen before. Or if they have been seen before, it's like 100 years ago, and we have more manuscripts, and we can establish the text better. So we look at it again. All three of the collections cover, you know, all of the categories we find in the New Testament. So we have Gospels, Acts, Letters, and Revelations. So we don't try to, you know, squeeze all of one genre in each volume. The idea being that we'll put in whatever people who work with us are interested in at the particular time. And it also 
gives a lot of variety in the volumes. So again, we have some gospels in this new third volume, and gospels can include not just stories about Jesus necessarily, but we also include stories about people connected closely with Jesus. So Mary Magdalene, for example, and John the Baptist. We have some things that we call orphan stories. So when people create critical editions of texts, they try to establish the earliest form of the text, so the common form of the text. And occasionally a story that will show up in manuscripts maybe in one or two, gets pushed down into the notes, into the critical apparatus. But those stories are interesting too. So we kind of bring our focus to these orphan tales. So this, we can talk more about it, but there's a story of the, the good bandit the, that shows up in some manuscripts. A lot of acts, these, this tends to be the, the more neglected portion of Apocrypha, because people really love gospels, right? But there's lots and lots of Apocryphal acts that haven't been published before. Some peculiar epistles. We have some in here from... Ignatius, an early second century writer, to the Apostle John and to the Virgin Mary. Not real. He didn't really write them, but it's interesting to see those. And five apocalypses, three of which have never been published before. So there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. One of my favorite traditions, actually, the good bandit tradition, the perfume of the bandit, right? We'll get into that story a little bit later, but yeah, I just love how somebody's mentioned like maybe in like two lines of the Gospel of Luke and then... <laughs> these huge medieval traditions expand upon it. Mm -hmm. What are a couple of your favorite texts from the new volume, if you'd like to highlight? The one I tend to talk about the most when talking about this volume is the Acts of John by Progress. There's a couple of reasons why I really like this one. For one, it's totally neglected. People are interested in the earliest apocryphal acts, and which the Acts of John is one of them. But the Acts of John by Progress is found in 150 Greek manuscripts alone, and then every language you can imagine. Very, very, very popular text, but neglected. There's never been an English translation until now. It's quite a lengthy text. It uh, deals with John in Ephesus for a little while, but then moving on to Patmos. So it's, it's combining the Apostle John with the Apostle of, of Revelation, in a sense. Though when John is on Patmos, he doesn't write the book of Revelation. He writes the Gospel of John. So it's this weird combination of elements that are canonical about the apostle, but goes against them at the same time. So he goes to various places on Patmos, you know, does the usual things one does as an apostle. You you heal, you teach, you fight some magicians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then eventually he goes back to Ephesus where he dies. So as I said, very influential elements of it show up in the iconography of John. My favorite one of these is on Patmos itself. So if you went to Patmos today, there's a chapel there. I've can't remember the date, 13th century, 15th century, fairly recently, relatively. It's decorated with images from this text. So this is the kind of thing that interests me about kind of this blurry line between what's canonical and non-canonical. A church is full of images from a non-canonical text. And we, we see lots of examples of this, but this is a really good example of it. And also in canonical biblical manuscripts, often the gospels have some prefaces that introduce the text with some biographical information about our authors. And information from Acts of John by Procris goes into these prologues. So again, there's that blurry line between canonical and non-canonical. Procris, by the way, is John's uh, disciple. So he's the guy who writes this text. And again, here's another example of the breaking down. If you look at some manuscripts, say between 1100 or so and 1500 or so of the Bible, you often see introductory pages showing the evangelist at work. And many of them will show John dictating his gospel to Procris, which is exactly what he does at the end of this text. So these uh, non-canonical traditions really enter into canonical ideas quite a lot. Second text, I mentioned three, the Acts of Christ and Peter in Rome. This is, again, an Acts text. It talks about Peter journeying from Palestine to Rome, where he will eventually be crucified under Nero. But another character in the text is this child slave that he has accompanying him. And it's actually Jesus in disguise. So it's a post-resurrection Jesus, but appearing as a child. And some of the stories of Jesus interacting with Peter in Rome are transformations of the infancy gospel of Thomas stories. So it's an Acts text, but it brings in gospel stories. So it's really a weird kind of combination of, of things. It's not as widely known as like Procris text. There's only maybe four Greek manuscripts and a bunch in Sl Slavic. So not very widely known, but uh, interesting nonetheless. And the third text I think is interesting is a text called The Questions of John, which some of your listeners may be aware of. This is a, a 12th century Bogomil text. Bogomils are, are a medieval form of Gnostic ideas or dualistic ideas. And it's been fairly widely translated before, but this is one of those, we brought, we, we, we thought we'd do this because it tends to be examined in the context of medieval 
Christianity or medieval heresies, and not a lot by Apocrypha scholars. So it's, it's a way of kind of bringing that into conversation with Apocrypha. And it's a rather late composition compared to some of our other ones. So here in this text, John has this dialogue with the resurrected Jesus. And Jesus answers his questions about creation. And he talks about how creation was not by God, but by Satan as, a, as an evil second power. And he creates a world. And he creates humanity. And this is a, basically the same kind of role we have with the Demiurge in early Gnostic texts. So yeah, a, a fun text, rather late medieval, but still apocryphal. And it's one of the things about apocrypha. As I mentioned at the start, they weren't just created in the first three centuries. They are created throughout Christian History, including even up to today with something like the Gospel of Jesus' Wife, just about a decade ago, people still work with these characters to get certain ideas across. And it's something that we all in the field find quite fascinating. And that's actually what I really love about this volume of texts. We were talking about Lucian backstage, and I've been thinking a lot about intertextuality and Bakhtinian kind of polyphonic voices, <laughs> lots of nerdy stuff. You know, the Acts and these apocryphal texts really are carnival-esque that kind of literature that the human creative impulse lets their imagination go wild, maybe in a safer space that isn't be held to the pressures of being authoritative. You know, people can explore this creative impulse. Lucian explores this in his own way with uh, something like a true story where he has Odysseus constantly still as a character on the Isle of the Blessed, still trying to change the nature of the story, even as he did with the Odyssey. These texts function in a similar way. They really turn things on their head, like you were just talking about the acts of Peter and Jesus in Rome. Jesus manifests as not only a child, but as a slave. What does that say? You know, the exploration. I'm going to talk about a couple of my favorites just from across all these volumes. The first one will actually be The Good Bandit, because all of these texts, regardless, beautifully illustrate the human impulse for ultimately storytelling, right? So The Good Bandit is a huge example from Aside from Luke, he's not mentioned anywhere. All these texts greatly expand upon it. So let's talk about the good bandit. Could you summarize that story, the traditions that follow from it? Yeah, I think in Christian history, every character in the Bible will get spun off into its own story. Everyone gets a name who is unnamed. Nothing is left unexplored, right? So as you mentioned, very little stuff in the canon about this character, but it begs exploration. Who is this guy? Why does he deserve to be first to go to heaven, essentially? So as I said earlier, the bandit traditions tend to be orphan stories. They get added in manuscripts of infancy narratives, but though also in the Gospel of Nicodemus, one of them shows up. And the idea is to almost kind of have a foreshadowing story about this character later on. Jesus, as a child, encounters the bandit and then later on, he will encounter him again. And in the bandit stories, he's always, a, of course, a good guy. He's the good bandit. He's associated with other robbers, but he doesn't really belong to them. And he shows the Holy Family in their time in Egypt, because this is where the stories are set, some kindness. Um, one of the texts is called The Hospitality of the Bandit, for example. So in the one that we have in the third volume, the Holy Family are in Egypt. The bandit is supposed to kill everyone he sees. Apparently, that's what the other bandits have told him to do. But he doesn't want to do that. He has to, to detect the, and show hospitality to this family. And he brings him into his home. And he has a child who's afflicted with leprosy. And Mary washes Jesus. And the water used to wash him, the bandit puts his own child in the same water and is healed. And then there's a bit of a sequel in that Mary ends up bottling the water and it becomes this wonderful perfume with miraculous qualities. And the bandit ends up giving it to Mary Magdalene. And once she washes herself with it, she repents from her sinful ways. And we also have a backstory for Mary Magdalene. How is it that she went from being a prostitute, according to Christian tradition, but not canonical stories, to being someone who is redeemed? Yeah, really interesting story, but it shows a few other things too that I'm particularly interested in because I, I like infancy stories. And I also am interested in pilgrimage and things associated with contact with the divine. And I can imagine a story like this in which some church somewhere, probably in Egypt, but this is a Latin story, so it can also be in the West, has bottled bath water of Jesus that it's selling to pilgrims, right? And this is the backstory for it. This is the legitimation for it. Or swaddling bands, because in the Arabic MC gospel, the swaddling bands of Jesus also have healing properties. So you can see a church will have the swaddling bands of Jesus, which can also produce healing. So I always sort of try to think of the larger world around these texts as well and how they actually affect piety. Great little story. And again, tends to be ignored because it's always just in kind of the footnotes. 
of our edition. A couple of the things I really love about the story. I'll get to the bottled bathwater mm-hmm. first because you just mentioned that. It really reminded me of our last conversation about Judas pennies and the Judas tradition. Oh, yeah. You know, just the same kind of concept. Of very likely some church somewhere has a holy relic or something and there's like a backstory. Just thinking about the Acts and the apocryphal Acts And these different types of texts, relationships with something like the Greco-Roman novel, you have something like the Bukaloi or the bandits always portrayed as invariably bad, no matter what. And you have this bandit and he's like honorable and he's showing Mary Magdalene and the infant Jesus hospitality, things like that. So, you know, people still, again, playing with expected roles and tropes. I love that. The next one we're going to get to is also something that I feel is interesting and has its echoes and stories from the ancient Mediterranean before the apocryphal literature, and that is the John the Baptist decapitation traditions. So I don't know if you could just talk about those a bit. We had a few John the Baptist texts in volume one, including a text called Life John the Baptist by Serapion, which is written in Arabic. So again, a little out of uh, many biblical scholars attention because it's not a language they usually deal with but really interesting text i love that text it has a tradition of john's head flying around jerusalem for years screaming about herod so you know who doesn't like a flying head but in the third volume we have a few texts in greek byzantine so we're talking about maybe eighth century ninth century something like that that i ended up editing it's supposed to be in volume two but we ran out of room so they got pushed to number three these are uh, texts that somewhat overlooked. It. They were mentioned by a German scholar around 1904, and then were not really looked at again. So whenever I see something like that happening in the literature, I say, well, this is something that we should try to dig more into. And um, we have two texts in the volume. One's called The Martyrdom of Zechariah. The other one is called The Decapitation of John the Baptist. But they cover similar ground. So I'll talk more about The Martyrdom of Zechariah once. The longer one's probably the earlier one. Our work on this was based on two Greek manuscripts that were very difficult to read. I was just looking over the translation of it again today and seeing some awkwardness in it, but realizing, well, it's the best we could do with what we had. It's also found in a bunch of church Slavic, should say, manuscripts. So very popular in the Slavic world, but less popular in the Greek world. So basically what it does, it takes stories that we find about John the Baptist in the canon. So we have his birth, we have the party with Herod where he gets decapitated. And the author has taken those stories and added to it the story of John's near death by the soldiers of Herod that we find in the Port Evangelium of James. So this is where the soldiers come, try to kill John because they're after all of the babies because they're trying to kill the Messiah. And then Elizabeth takes John and goes to a mountain, prays to God, the mountain opens up and she goes inside and the mountain closes. It's interesting to me that the author sees that story as authoritative too, even though it's non-canonical, but it's certainly a very, very popular text. So he's weaving those together. And at the very end of the text, he has a story of what happened to the Herods after. No one likes a villain to get off scot-free, so we need our villains to meet some horrible end. So the daughter of Herod and Herod and his wife all meet gruesome ends. And that's a very widespread text as well. It shows up in lots of other places. So we have these as our raw materials. And what does our author add in here? Well, it kind of puts in stuff in between. And one of the interesting stories in it is Zechariah has been killed by Herod's soldiers. Elizabeth and John are in the mountain. And an angel of God appears one night and brings John and Elizabeth to the temple where Zechariah's body has been hidden. Jesus is there too. Not clear if it's some kind of a spiritual kind of a being or Jesus as a child. It's never really made clear. And they raise Zechariah to life and baptize him. So in a way, it was kind of saying, well, Zechariah never got a chance to get baptized, yet he's a martyr, he's a saint, he should be baptized. So they baptize him and they baptize John. And so now we have a a baptism before the baptism of John as a 30-year-old. And I think it's partly is to address a saying of Jesus in the Gospels where he's asked by, I think, his apostles, if the baptism of John is from heaven or is it earthly? And it's quoted in the text. And here the explanation of what that means is it actually did come from the heavens. It was instituted by Jesus while John was still a child. So it's really kind of an interesting thing to do. So Zechariah is animated, gets baptized, he, he dies again. And then later on, when John dies, Elizabeth is spirited to where John's body is. And she takes it, again, spirited by angels to Jerusalem and buries it with the body of Zechariah. And then, of course, we get, you know, the story later on about John's death, which is embroidered in several ways. And then it ends saying that this was written by John's disciple, Europeus, 
you've never heard of before, and that the text is to be read on the day of John's festival. So again, used in liturgy in certain parts of the world, not very widely because we don't have all our manuscripts of it, but we need a text to read on John's martyrdom day. So here we create one and that's what they've done. Getting back to my conversation with Moroshnikov, he was talking about a, a text by Pseudo Evodius, where at the end he kind of lets the mask slip and he talks about how yeah, I'm kind of making this up for something, but it's such a pious thing that, you know, nobody would fault me for doing it. Let's get to that decapitated head aspect, because it's very interesting just seeing this head floating around, prophesying. What is actually going on there? I think it's in part to account for multiple relic sites. So uh, you have various people claim to have, have the body or the head of John the Baptist. So in the story, the head eventually lands in Emesa in Syria. And that is one of the sites that a church was built there that claimed to have a relic of John the Baptist. But then we have the body, which uh, I can't even remember exactly where it's taken, but it's taken to another site, and then it's burned. But later on, someone comes along and is able to find parts of the remains, and then they take that to Egypt. And that's the ultimate reason for why this text was written, because the text tells us in the 4th century, I think it was, a church of John the Baptist was created in Egypt, and they used the relics that come from that site where they were burned in Palestine to the site of this new church. So every church worth its salt has relics of saints or uh, backstories of how it was created by a saint who, who comes back from the dead or from the divine realm to help create a church. So every church needs some kind of a special connection with the biblical characters, with the divine world, or who's going to go? And if people don't go, they're not buying your stuff, your tchotchkes and your copies of texts and various other things. So pilgrimage is a thriving industry. So all of these churches need their special stories. Just the whole concept of like this prophesying head is really interesting and uh, has its antecedents. in uh, previous sensationalistic literature, like the paradoxography from figures like Phlegon of Trailies, right? Phlegon has that story about Polycritos, who is the ATLRQ who dies, and he comes back as a revenant. He devours his child's body, but he leaves the head, and the head starts prophesying. So it's the same kind of thing. You also have the story of the Orpheus head down in the hole that people would consult. Uh, these impulses, like for, I guess the sensational still are taken over in these texts. You know, if you come up with a new text where with the flying head of John the Baptist, it feels weird for us. But once you know more about the ancient world and that there are other stories like this, so it's not necessarily as strange to the, its original readers as it would be for us today. That's where scholarship comes in, right? It provides us our context so we can actually understand these texts better. Apocryphal texts really seem to take this role of taking over the sensational and the amazing and the paradoxographical and just putting them in things like this, where they talk about <laughs> uh, John the Baptist heads, Jesus bathwater, things like that. People still have that impulse for the sensational. We tend to lose sight of the fact that this research and these translations are being done by groups of like-minded people. They sacrifice time, they sacrifice recognition, and as scholars, you know, they sacrifice pay for bringing this research to the world. It's a really collaborative effort. Where do you see the field of apocryphal studies, as well as your New Testament apocrypha series, going in the next few years? Your point about collaboration is a good one. If you look through the volumes of the New Testament Apocrypha series, early collaborative, right? It's, it's a multi-author work. And if you look through the contents, you'll see that occasionally multiple names are attached to certain texts. And that's because people are collaborating. These texts are in lots and lots of different languages. And few of us can command knowledge of all of them. Or some of us have you know, great abilities. Some of us only know one or two languages. So with our kind of secret weapon in the MNTA series, it's Vladimir Chaplow who's our guy for Church Slavic. So he's worked on a few of the texts in this volume, and he's in the background a little bit here and there whenever we need to inquire into Church Slavic text. So yeah, it's all about collaboration because of the nature of the materials. In the future, there might be a volume four of this. I kind of said I really need a break. Editing takes a lot of time. And it also, it's a different way of working than writing your own work. It's a lot of corralling people and bugging them to get their stuff in on time. It's a lot of finessing the material you get. So it's, it's ready for publication. It's really rewarding to work with people. I really like it a lot, but it's also it has its certain frustration. The fourth volume might be a little bit in the future. I'd like to, you know, do some of my own work a bit more. 
I'm really happy to see Hugo's project going. That's it's it's people working on Apocrypha. That's not me, which is great. Uh, and Ivan, who has worked with me on these these volumes, he's working there now. And and it's nice to see some kind of spin-offs of sorts in other kinds of collaborative uh, endeavors to get these texts edited and printed. But in the meantime, we do have other things: scholarly organization, North American Society for the Study of Christian Apocrypha Literature, NASCO. We have other projects as well. We have a translation series in the payback. Um, pocketbook kind of series. And we just came up with the fourth volume in that series on the doctrine of Adai, uh, which was translated by, by Jacob Lawler. And it's a really nice little book. So we'll have more of those coming. NASCAL is also working on a journal, which might hopefully come out in about a year. I'd like to see more attention paid to some of the stuff we've talked about here, to material remains, art, sculpture, these kinds of things, and how they intersect with Apocrypha, sacred spaces, pilgrimage, things like that. So to, you get a sense of more lived experience of these texts. They're not just people wrote a text and left it, and that's it. It's not. They in, interact with the world around them. We also don't have in Apocrypha scholarship a lot of exegesis. Most of us are dealing with creating the text, establishing texts. So New Testament scholarship is getting a lot into feminist interpretation, queer interpretation, disability studies, but not a lot of this has been applied to Apocrypha. So I like, I'm hopefully hoping to see more of that in the future. and. One of the legacies of the volumes, I think, is that w some of us have worked with grad students to create the contributions that we've made. And so there's a certain mentor in going on in these volumes. And so we're seeing newer, younger scholars who are coming into their own, and hopefully they're, they'll continue to work in this field and, and bring new uh, perspectives and new skills to it. So when you said one part of a project in NASCAR was not just about, you know, creating works for everyone to read, which is all wonderful, but it was about uh, growing our discipline. And I think it's done a lot for that. And so the, it's, it's nice to now start to see it kind of bear fruit in various ways. I usually plug at the end of these appearances, the NASCAL website. It has on it something called the eClavis, which is a big comprehensive bibliography about these texts. So you have there something along the lines of about 300 texts, each of which has a page, which gives a, a summary of the text, various bibliographical resources, links to manuscripts, links to artifacts, and it's all open access. Like Again, part of the reason I do podcasts like this is I'm very much into getting scholarship out to a wide audience, and that's what the NASCAL site is designed for. So it's for scholars, but there's no gatekeeping. It's it's out there for everyone to use. And NASCAL also does a, what's called a First Fridays workshop, which um, it's scholarly in a sense. We distribute a paper a week or so in advance, and then the scholar will talk about the paper. But it's open. We're happy to see anyone come as long as, you know, as long as they're behaving. I really want people to take advantage of these of these resources and, and connect to the texts, uh, connect with scholarship and, and learn as we learn. We're all really interested in this literature and we like to share that with the world. You know, it's it's all a collaborative effort and I appreciate everything you'll do. I love that there are passionate people out there who are bringing this work to a lay audience such as myself.